I'm a registered psychologist and I work at Deakin University in the area of uh, health behaviour research. So I teach in uh, the area of health promotion and also researching interventions and programs that are aiming to change behaviours of children and adolescents at a population level. Kids care is a really, I mean you could think about it in a number of ways but probably the simplest way to think about it is thinking of it as a framework and a suite of processes that a community can use to uh, uh, find, to, to, to improve the developmental outcomes of children and adolescents in their community. So it provides uh, a framework where communities can identify problems, identify strategies that they can use and implement, and implement and evaluate those and find out what they've achieved. Well, it has its origins in the United States uh, and they've invested heavily in communities that care and there's a lot of evidence around whether CTC works. So communities that care has been tested quite rigorously in terms of longitudinal studies. So they've tested kids and followed kids over a period of time. And they've also run what we call randomised controlled trials. So they've given CTC to some communities and not other communities and over time see whether there are changes. And CTC communities have come out better in terms of reducing kids' risk factors and behaviours such as smoking, drinking, illicit drug use, um, depression, anxiety, teenage pregnancies, antisocial behaviour and violence. So it's based on a developmental model and they also use the term of um, a social development model. So it's about identifying uh, what things are placing or what factors or influences in the community in the family, in the school, and things associated with the individual that are placing a child at risk of developing behaviours later on in life. So what it's about is helping the community gather evidence that will identify things, what we call risk factors, that place kids at risks in all these different tiers or, tiers or domains of life, and also things that might protect or buffer kids from ending up um, acting out or performing those behaviours. So it identifies ways that communities gather this evidence and then with that evidence in hand, then they look for proven strategies that have been shown to work, published in the uh, research literature that have been shown to work and they implement a number of these strategies in their community. And then they evaluate that over a period of time and they look for changes. So it's a really simple framework based on look for the evidence, use evidence-based programs and look for the change. And the change comes by first, the first step of reducing risk factors and increasing protective factors. So the youth survey is a really core component of CTC. So CTC is often sort of talked about as being an evidence-based program, an evidence-based framework. So if you are about evidence, you need to gather evidence. So in terms of identifying what needs to be done in the community, you need to gather the evidence. You need to develop a profile, a story, or a narrative of what's going on in your community. So the CTC Youth Survey is really that component. The community then usually go into the schools and they'll survey the adolescents because if you can access the schools, you're accessing predominantly most of the population in that community. So you then will deliver a survey and that will identify and the kids will respond about certain things which will give us an indicator of whether they're exposed to certain risks in all those domains I was just talking about at the individual level, the family and school level and the broader community. And it also will give us an indication of the protective factors and then it'll also tell us whether they're drinking, smoking, engaged in sex, engaged in antisocial behaviour or violence and crime. And then with all that data in hand you can then see where the most vulnerable youth are in terms of ages, in terms of risk factors, in terms of location, in terms of family, in terms of the community. Risk factors, I mean, sometimes it sounds a bit technical and a bit scientific, but really what it is is saying, if you were to measure something or identify something at one point in time, is it predictive or is it highly associated with something later on? And so a risk factor is saying, say a, a, a child lives in a family that has a lot of family conflict. Well, that's a predictor of perhaps engaging in antisocial behaviour, drug and alcohol use, and early teenage sex later on in life. So if we can intervene and reduce that family conflict, 
then that's going to reduce the chances that that child is going to engage in those behaviours. So a risk factor is sort of really something that is highly predictive or associated with something occurring later on in life. So a protective factor is, works in the same way, it's predictive of something not occurring, so it's about buffering the effect of harmful behaviours. So if a family, if a child lives in a warm and uh, uh, welcoming family, it gives that child opportunities to engage in a meaningful way, that's giving them an opportunity to develop meaningful relationships with an adult, and that can be protective because it gives the child a warm, comforting environment, and that'll be protective of outcomes or poor outcomes later in life. So that could be drug and alcohol use, early teenage sex, all those other things I've already spoken about. So a social development strategy really is really the sort of key foundation for protective factors. So while we talk about risk factors and they're uh, a way of anticipating behaviours or predicting behaviours, the social development strategy is about if we really want to build kids um, and put them on healthy trajectories, we've got to build in protective factors. And the social development strategy is about doing that. So it's saying what you need to do with kids is give them the opportunities to meaningfully engage in their community. Give them the opportunity to feel like they're contributing to their community and recognise that in an important public way. And if the child feels that they're contributing meaningfully and they're being recognised, well then they develop attachments to their community and the adults that are guiding them. And with that foundation, they're better off and probably more likely not to engage in those behaviours and also adapt or adopt healthy behaviours and standards that the community is trying to promote. The community profile really comes out of the CTC Youth Survey. Well, that's one component of it. The CTC Youth Survey will give the community an idea of what the level of risk factors are, what the protective factors are, and what the level or prevalence of those behaviours that they're trying to reduce in the CTC framework. But then also then, in terms of the CTC approach, it then gathers evidence that this, the community might already be gathering. So it'll gather hospital data, crime data, school attendance data, school result data, and it puts all this together including stuff about what resources, what programs, what strategies, what money they're investing in, those sorts of things. And then with all that information together, you've got a comprehensive picture of what's going on in your community, how you're tackling it, where your deficits are and where your strengths are. And with that information in hand, you can create an action plan to change what you want to change and target the risk and protective factors that you want to change. The community action plan is the next stage in terms of after you've developed a profile. So the profile has given you and your community and all the key stakeholders and the board and the key leaders an understanding of what's going on in that community. Now with that information in hand, you, want, you know as a community you want to change things and you identify through that profile behaviours you want to reduce. And then you'll say, okay, the evidence says that these risk factors and these protective factors are associated with these behaviours. So as a community, we want to reduce these behaviours. We want to see less drinking. We want to see less smoking. We want to see less violence and crime. So we know from the evidence and the information that we provide as part of the CTC engagement process that you can see that certain risk factors are linked to those. So you'll pick programs that will target those risk factors and you implement them. So you create an action plan over a period of time. You identify risk factors and identify your outcomes. And so in terms of evaluation, what you're wanting to see is reduction in those risk factors and then a bit later on a reduction in those outcome behaviours and an increase in your protective factors and an increase in the behaviours that you're trying to change or decrease. Yeah, now evidence base is another one of those words that's bandied around in terms of this area, in terms of health and social development. But really what it's saying is, if anything you do, there needs to be evidence, there needs to be research demonstrating the efficacy or the effectiveness of that implementation or that strategy. So if a community is going to implement a strategy, which is say perhaps targeting um, uh, early teenage drinking, well you need to make sure that that program has been uh, tested and been published as shown to work. And so it needs to be scrutinised and published and so that the, what the, the community is investing in are programs that are known to work, not guessing or hoping that they're working. 
So that makes really the CTC a really strong framework because what you're doing is only implementing things that work and you're implementing multiple things. So you're, imp you're targeting a problem at multiple directions and multiple levels. So there's the stronger chance that you're gonna get good positive outcomes. So evidence-based means looking for evidence that things work, but also looking for evidence to show that what you've done works too. So you gather evidence before you start and you gather evidence after you've implemented the strategies and then you've gathered the evidence to show whether you, what you've done has been effective. Well, there's lots of evidence in the United States. Pennsylvania and uh, Washington have got some really great examples, but they're far removed over the Pacific Ocean for Australia. But we have brought CTC to Australia uh, uh, for now about, I think, about 12 years, and we've run some pilot communities in Australia. And probably one of our really good success stories is the Mornington Peninsula Shire. They've been running CTC for 10 years now, and, and CTC operates through a cycle of five phases, and the, that's phases go, those five phases just keep going as the community keeps going. So they've gone through three phases of that, and over that three phases, they've seen reduction in risk factors and increasing protective factors. But in terms of outcomes, they've seen reductions in early teenage sex, cannabis use, cigarette use, and alcohol use, and antisocial behaviour. Now, with that evidence in hand, they're wanting to continue with CTC and also look at other things like depression and anxiety. So the five phases, normally in a standard sort of well-funded model, would take about two years, but can sometimes take about two to five years. But overall, in terms of the vision, we're looking for a community change to happen between two and ten years. So you're going to get really good outcomes in ten years with early indicators at two and five. But as a community implements CTC, they need to know, uh, they need to be guided by structure, they need to know what processes are, they need benchmarks and performance indicators, and CTC provides all that in a very incremental managed way. But broadly, all that's broken down into five phases. And the first one is getting started, uh, the second one is getting organised, the third one is developing a profile, the, th the fourth one is creating a plan, and the fifth one is implementation and evaluation. And I've spoken a little bit about all those sorts of things, but the first two phases are out really getting key people in the, in the community behind the investing in CTC, and then creating a board and a key leader group that are really gonna drive CTC over time. They're gonna fly the flag, open doors to get resources and maintain that it's sustainable. And then it's about collecting the data, developing your profile, identifying what you want to target, creating your action plan, and implementing an, implementing an evaluation strategy. You can't just say, let's, the CTC sounds great, oh, let's drop it in this community or that community. Well, it's, it's like anything, if, if, like a child, if a child's not ready or developed to engage in something, you can have all the best intentions in the world and it's just not going to go anywhere. So the same in CTC, you know, it's a living, breathing uh, organisation and process and it's working with living, breathing human beings. And if that's to work, you know, the community needs to be at a right level. So they need to have an understanding that this is about prevention, that this is about a long-term vision. They need to understand about public health. They need to understand about risk factors and protective factors. So they need this sort of general knowledge about social development, human development, risk factors, protective factors, thinking about prevention, thinking about uh, um, identifying impacts, all that sort of thing, all that sort of information the community needs a general knowledge about. But the board and the people that are driving CDC specifically need to have their head around that sort of thing because they need to be managing what they're doing and whether they're on track. Could you describe the governance of Coombs the Care in a community? So, it's important, like any good organisation or any good structure, that there is some sort of governance structure. And CTC is part of its resources, provides a template for a structure of governance. And that basically includes where well, you will have, as part of stage two or phase two, getting your community board together. And that community board is really the engine room. And that will represent stakeholders in the community from the education, police, health, um, Anyway, doctors, medical, anyone that has a key stakeholder in, in a key stake 
in youth development and positive health outcomes for your community. So though you could have between 20 and 10 and 30 members on your board and they'll represent the driving forward and the, sta and the, and the sectors in that community. You also then have attached to that board key leaders who represent CTC and who will talk and promote CTC, but also have access to policy makers, key people and key funders who will help the board get funding and help the board get buy-in into various important areas. So the really two sort of key components in terms of governance are your community board and your key leaders. And then within those boards, you will have sub-working groups working on a whole lot of things. But to make, or should make sure that all works together and it works with a nice piece of well oiled machinery, you need a community coordinator. And that community coordinator helps synthesise all the developments working with all those people. But also make sure that they are meeting regularly and an initiative is not falling behind. And to have that, you'll need an agency that auspices that person and then houses and prepares to, you know, say CTC is the home here for this organisation. Well, often, you know, often the first people that are involved are the schools, and that's really important because you want access to the schools to get the survey done. But really, that's where your kids are. But there are a portion of kids that don't attend school, and we need to access them too. But we're getting the majority of them through the school. So you want schools, you want police, you want a Department of Education, you want health, you want GP, you want primary care partnerships, you want uh, sports clubs, you want anywhere or anyone that has access or dealings with youth and children. What's the role of schools in community care process? Well, it can have a number of roles and it depends on what the school at the, the community wants to do in terms of implementing strategy. So the school can be at first, the point of data collection. So you're getting a representation, uh, a, a representative sample or representative data set of what's going on in your school, in, in your community. But you also want then to be able to implement programs and strategies to the kids in the school, in the school setting, but you can also use them as an entry point to access families. Because we intervene at the family levels, then you can intervene and offer family resources and programs through the school. So it's a great entry point. <clears throat> Um, but, but they're also good, I suppose, in, um, in, in promoting the CTC thing because they also have uh, a lot of access to a lot of other people. So really, I suppose they're really our entry point, um, but they provide avenues to other services and programs that they're using. It's been going for about 12 years in Australia. Um, and I can't remember the years now, and if I had someone could jot my memory, but I think, it's, I think it might have started in about 1992. Um, so it really sort of came out of the origins of a key group of academics wanting to um, identify a, an effective way of creating behavioural change for the long term. And so there was a number of academics who was probably primarily led by Professor John Toombaroo at the Centre for Adolescent Health. And, you know, they identified through a really seminal piece of work called the Risk and Protective Factor Framework, which was published in 1992 by Professor Richard Catalano and Professor David Hawkins. And they thought this really spoke to what was going on and what was needed. So they developed a conversation with the academics over there, and they invited them to come over here. Richard Catalano came over here. He had a sabbatical, talked about it, trained up some people here, and then went back a few years later then, we sent some academics and some team over there, they got trained up, and now we've tried to pilot with that knowledge in hand, that program and that framework, or adapt it to an Australian setting. And it's important that we didn't say, okay, this works in the States, now let's go and dump it here in Australia. We've had to pioneer it and pilot it, and that's taken 10 years. And a lot of people wouldn't want to invest in that sort of thing, but as, as I was showing you, and I've shown in some presentations before, that there are really good results. If you take the time to plan well, gather your evidence and invest, you're gonna get long-term sustainable change. And so we've shown that we can adapt this model to Australia, and now we're trying to roll that out in far more communities in Australia at the moment. So the Department of Justice has been uh, offered to fund four communities in Australia uh, to roll out CTC over a period of two years. And so they're looking, while well, they have the Department of Justice, 
they call the Department of Justice and Regulation. They're interested in, in outcomes of crime and antisocial behaviour, but they're also well aware that if you set up an infrastructure and a program that has um, multiple outcomes because you're targeting one influence, it's a, well, it's a really good investment. So the Department of Justice can see the benefit investing in something like CTC, which has outcomes on antisocial behaviour and crime, but also has links with uh, tobacco use and alcohol use, which is also linked to crime and also health behaviours. It's a really good investment. So the Department of Justice are backing CTC in Australia and saying, we're willing to fund this for four, for four communities over two years to get them up and running through the five phases and at the same time helping them and supporting them to find a sustainable way of keeping that going. What's the background to Warnable being selected as one of those communities? Well, Warnable's been a long-term friend in terms of CTC. We've tried to invest in CTC across Australia in a number of communities. And in fact, we've got, I think, 14 communities engaging in CTC as a formal process. But we've also got a number of pioneer communities, about five of them, which are a bit like Mornington, which we piloted, and a number of other ones. So we've got things like Yarra and Knox. They're also involved in it. So there are a lot of communities being involved or that are currently involved with CTC. But um, some have had more opportunities than others and some have secured funding. But um, um, the Department of Justice asked us to identify the communities that we thought would be worth investing in CTC in this two-year frame because they wanted to invest in something that was going to be able to show some outcomes. So there needed to be certain readiness in some of these communities. And Warnable was showing signs of being ready and ready to move through to the next phase. So it was a low-risk strategy in terms of what were you doing in, in these communities in terms of making sure they're going to get through. Well, the idea would be to gather evidence uh, and to undertake a, a trial um, in communities with communities of care and compare that with communities that don't. So we're embarking on that and we've started that. And so in hopefully in three to four years, possibly five years, we'll have evidence to show whether CTC works and whether implementing CTC is a good investment. At the same time, while we're looking for outcomes in risk, in risk and protective factors and behavioural outcomes, we're also investing in economic analysis of how good and what's the benefit of investing in CTC over this period of time. Well, that's always a tricky one because, you know, CTC is, you know, and this, it's always hard because in the States, they've got different funding arrangements the way they fund research projects and community projects. So, you know, when we look at what they've done in the States, they've had a lot more money than we've had. So we've had to think, and when we've adapted this to the Australian setting, how do we work this out? So usually what we've done, or up to this point, is we've given communities some seed funding and we've supported them along the way. But at the same time, they need to identify ways of getting funding too um, to sustain the process. So some of that could be by working with the people that are going to get the outcomes in your, in your action plan. They're saying, look, this is an investment and a well-considered investment and a low-risk investment in terms of is there evidence that this works? Can you invest in some of this? And we'll, you know, in terms of, in terms of, instead of thinking about, will we be treating these kids five years, 10 years down the track? We're gonna prevent this and we're gonna invest in it now. So it might mean that we need to think about the investment becomes beforehand rather than post. Or sometimes you need to look for philanthropic funding. So things like Rotary and those sorts of organizations that wanna invest in it. So it's not really, um, something I've had a lot to do with because it really happens at a community level and it's really something we're trying to think through on our feet because we really haven't got to the end point with most communities in terms of what are they funding with. But you know, um, a lot of people use the framework like Mornington to, to show to funding bodies and funding organisations what they're doing. But what they're doing is really based in strong evidence and is a sound action plan. And that usually is a strong argument for funding bodies to say, look, these people have really thought this through. It is a well-considered plan. We'll give some money to that. And probably the first thing was try and get you, um, try and speak to someone about CTC. And you can go to the CTC website, which is a sub-page on the Royal Children's Hospital. Um, there is also a wealth of information on the CTC sites for the American model. 
Um, and if you just search communities that care, you'll find all that sort of information quite readily. The other thing I would then ask you to do is probably speak to a community that's already engaging in CTC. Ask them what their problems, what their hurdles, what their barriers. You know, it's not all, you know, um, songs of praise. You know, there are problems. But at the end point, you know, most people are very happy with what they're achieving and what they're doing. And then, of course, you can speak to the CTC team, CTC Limited, which is a not-for-profit organisation which houses and delivers all this through Australia. And, of course, all those details are on the Australian website.